Welcome to the Home Lab Show, episode 44, Dev Random. We had so many ideas that we were flinging all over the place, and uh, I was out of the office last week, so was Jay. We both had some things. I was building a new studio. Jay had some personal things going on. So we didn't quite have a show, but then we had too many ideas almost. like Yeah. <laughs> it was hard to land on. So you know, let's just do a Dev Random and run through some of these. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we have a good list. We're going to cap the show at an hour because I think the list is exceeding what we may talk about an hour. We're not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And any of these topics could be something we dive into deeper later. So it's we, we, this is a new experiment with us, Dev Random. This is kind of like the Q&A episodes. Me and Jay want to do a few of them. <laughs> Yeah, it's just basically things that um, each independent, each individual item wouldn't probably make an episode of them by itself. So um, we there's some things we want to talk about, but it's like, do we want to have a five minute episode for this one topic that is just super quick? No, uh, let's just kind of just go through all these different things. Yeah. And like I said, a lot of this leads to further discussion. We do listen greatly to the audience so we can make sure we're covering topics that are always relevant to them. So, hey, feel free to throw some things in the chat. Uh, hit us up on a feedback form if you listen to this uh, not during the live. And uh, I should turn down things that make noise. So, <laughs> yes, I should probably do the same. Yeah, I just realized I have a couple things on. So we're going to do that. Those, you know, technical details you don't think about in a new studio. But hey, here we are. So let me. Uh, yeah, that's a good problem to have, I think. Good good problem to have. And this is the first time we're doing this show from the, my new studio. So bear with us if there's any technical difficulties. But I think I had them all started out. Now, where there has not been any technical difficulties is with our sponsor. Uh, we've been working with Linode since the beginning and they want to continue sponsoring the show. They've been a great host and they uh, were a great sponsor. And yeah, they are just a great place to host all the different magic that they have in their system. If you're looking for places and someone actually po posted in my forums, and I thought this was a clever and maybe we should do an episode breaking this down. And it's a way to run an, a proxy in Linode that proxies in front of your servers in your home lab and ways to get connectivity oh. to it. I think this might be a fun uh, Linode and Linode was talking about, Hey, is there any other, you know, includes you could do? And that might be a fun episode. And this is something you can absolutely run in Linode. This would keep your public IP from being exposed, but still allow you to run services, learn about how things work and never worry about someone, you know, attacking your public IP or revealing who you are through it. Uh, I think this might be kind of clever. They're going to know your Linode IP, but that is something you can always, you know, build, stand up the server in Linode, tear it back down and move it over to another location if you want. It creates some interesting scenarios and this is pretty easily facilitated with some of the, you know, auto ways to build it in Linode. But of course, in this show, we dive into the manual way to build it because um, I want to do a whole site to site video. And I'm, I'm thinking that might be a fun one as well, where you for especially people stuck behind CG Nat. I think these are some fun ideas and absolutely all these can be run with our sponsor, Linode. We have an offer code to get you started. Uh, you'll find that in the show notes there. And uh, absolutely great sponsor. We thank them for continued support of the show. And uh, that's what keeps us going on this stuff. You know, yep. got to pay the bills. <laughs> so, <laughs> someone said we should have a different sponsor because we keep having the same one. I, I, you know, I like the simplicity of having uh, one sponsor, especially one that's easy to work with and is centered. It, it, there's a big crossover. A lot of you people probably already use Linode for uh, some of these projects. But now we got to dive into the dev random of things. So that... Yep. Uh, what was the first thing on our list? Was it oh G parted? Yep. Yeah. G parted live. Yep. And and that and a couple of these are tools that I think should be in everyone's uh toolkit, so to speak. G parted live is just one of those. It's not something that I need every day, every week, or even every month. Uh sometimes I can go several months without needing it, but it's always good to have it on hand whenever I do. And it could be something as simple as, you know, um, you, some hard drives that were previously used with LVM or, Z, or ZFS, and I want to just, you know, purge everything. There's many different tools that allow you to do that. Gparted Live is not the only way. It's not even the primary reason I would use it, but it is one. I just want to nuke everything. I could do that. Um, another uh, use case for it is sometimes Linux installation utilities, they don't really give you the option to partition the way that you want to. So sometimes it makes sense to use Gparted Live before you install Linux because they'll tell they'll let you tell it where the mount points are that you want for your installation, but they might not facilitate creating the partitions. So you could use Gparted Live to create the partitions the way you want them, and then uh, launch a Linux installer and, and get that installed. 
So that's actually one way I can use LVM with Ubuntu because I, I still don't know why this is the case. You you use LVM with Ubuntu through the official installer and it uses up 100% of the available space. And I do understand most people want that, but then that eliminates LVM snapshots. It'll give you an option like Debian does to say like, I want 80% of that, not 100% of it. I want some some wiggle room here. And with Gparted Live, you can create the LVM config beforehand, just the way you want it, and then install your distro. So it's one of those things I just always love to have around. It's also really clean. I'm trying to remember the Linux command. Maybe you can help me out with this. Windows has a tool called sdelete that you can do online, mm -hmm. but there's an offline tool you use in Linux to basically shrink a virtual machine that's taking up too much space when you have it thin provisioned. Uh, it's uh, built into Gparted. What's that? I can't remember the name of the tool. Resize 2FS. Resize 2FS, I think is what there it is. There you go. Yeah. And what it does, um, it it's also does, a, uh, writes out a bunch of zeros uh, to the drive as well. It's like a, it, oh. yeah, it does. It's a way you can shrink your VM. The resize 2FS is allowed to increase a VM, but Gparted has got all the utilities you need for doing things like that. When you run into some of those problems, uh, some of the VM can get kind of over time, a little bit bigger than he should be on a thin provision and you can shut it down windows i know it's s delete there's an equivalent command in uh there and s delete's not part of windows uh, it's something though that's from microsoft part of the tool set but g parted becomes very handy for that very handy for fixing when tom goofs up a, a logical volume <laughs> or or maybe right. a couple of broken times you know how i learned about grub by breaking it <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and there's some other things too that are that kind of annoy me sometimes. Like it's like these problems that happen every once in a while. So you don't quite remember, but you'd remember it being a pain where you, you know, again, I'll use the example of LVM or ZFS, where you have to reload something in the kernel just to get it to recognize the fact that you deleted all the partitions and some installers will uh, give you the option to delete partitions, but they'll error out when it tries to do so because they don't like they try to automatically mount and activate LVM, but that might not be what you want. So now the kernel sees your disk as LVM. It's a previous installation and it's trying to safeguard you, but you're just trying to like delete everything. Um, and then it could become a pain. So um, yeah, it's just a great tool to have. Pretty much, I, I consider it the Swiss army knife of partitioning basically. Yeah. And it's for recovery and things like that. When things have broken, it's just, it works well. We'll just say that it's one of those yep. handy dandy, keep that in there. And yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. So um, another, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I would say, well, let's go to the next one. The system rest uh, or no mem test. Yes. That, there's a, a really big reason why I mentioned this because I, I don't know what this is. And I think it's because, and this is a valid reason that, Home labbers and Linux enthusiasts are more likely, in my opinion, to be using older hardware. Nothing wrong with that because, you know, that server that served a, you know, huge company like 15 years ago, that server was great for them back then, but now it's kind of, you know, too slow and we can't really get as much use out of it. But for a home lab, it's great because you're just, you know, one person or a handful of people, but it's hand-me-down hardware, which, which is usually a good idea. You save a lot of money. Same with desktops, laptops. Why buy something new? You could, and I'll talk about this later. You could buy something um, that's not quite new, but still better than what's available for new for cheap. But the problem is often that your memory will be bad. Um, and this happens a lot more than people think. And I, I can't count how many times I've seen people try to install Linux and it doesn't work well or at all and it doesn't make sense but windows worked fine for example um and then i'll mention you should try to check your memory then the rebuttal is usually well but it was fine with windows so i don't think that's the problem well the truth is each operating system handles or doesn't handle memory issues completely differently so um, one operating system might be more tolerant to a specific type of hardware failure than another one. So the argument it worked on my previous OS doesn't work on this one isn't really a valid argument. Um, I would say memtest86, you should test your memory once a year on everything. Um, your servers, the physical servers, obviously don't run it in your VMs. There's no reason to do, do that. Yeah. Um, run it in your you know physical machines and your desktop, laptop, um, servers, just run it. And usually I just run it for 15 minutes. Um, I haven't seen a case personally i'm not saying this doesn't happen where you let it run longer than 15 minutes and it finds errors usually if it's going to find errors it's going to run i mean it's going to show those errors like pretty much within the first five to ten minutes so if it lasts 15 minutes you're probably in good shape 
and you'll know when it finds finds errors like the screen turns red it looks hideous um it's pretty in your face yeah. last time i used this so um it's so common uh memory issues and and things like that and i i think sometimes people will get upset at linux for not working on their hardware when all along they had um bad memory and sometimes memory issues are um they're kind of weird to be honest like like i would love to say this is the symptom but it's always something different something strange i remember one time and i still don't really understand how why this happened but i used to be in game development i was never good at it uh, it was just something i was doing for fun with friends i would just you know design a game and send it to a friend it's like one level or something maybe as many as 10 and one game i developed had a a save feature so you could continue where you left off which is cool um, worked fine for me. So I send it off to a friend and they save and resume their game. They end up in a random level. I'm like, what? What the heck? So then I um, recompile it. I look at the code and um, I can't find an error. And it turns out my memory was bad. <laughs> it's on the desktop I was using to develop the game on. And the resulting executable was corrupt, even though on my system it was working just fine. I still can't understand that. But there's just all these weird things from like Linux installations failing to development errors, uh, file errors, all these different things. So just test your memory and just make it a point to um, do that as regularly as you can. It's not the most fun thing in the world to do, but it's pretty important. Now I have seen it take longer and we've had to have some machines, the real mystery ones that just don't do it very frequently. You'll have to run numerous iterations of memtest to get the result. And it kind of goes to the randomness of a memory problem, especially when it's a very infrequent one. And they're the worst problems because they're not re easily repeatable. It's the best way to describe it. Right. You end up with a problem that is like, yeah, just it's it almost is a repeatable because we know it happens. We see the result, but making it consistently happen under certain conditions um, becomes very, very difficult. And sometimes you just have to take parts of memory out. I will warn there's occasionally and Memtest has been updated uh, over the years to fix some of this. But occasionally you run into some configurations that Memtest just fails on immediately, not because there's a problem. It's because of an incompatibility in it. So, yes, it, I have so you have to look at what the error messages are throw them into a Google search and really, you know, it, it's, it's challenging at times, but it's definitely very handy tool, especially with, uh, I, I find it very compatible with laptops and sometimes have helped us solve some of those laptop troubleshooting issues just by running memtest code. Oh yeah. looks like some of the memory is not well in this swap it out and away you go. Saves you so much, especially when Linux can be memory efficient. It's only when you run the bigger applications that it hits the section of memory where those bits are a little bit less stable and it does not yeah. hold the memory and then flip in a bit. If it's, you know, um, not important bit, you didn't notice it. If it's an important bit to a running process, well, and that process wasn't set to auto restart or loses or ends up in an unknown state, you have, you have random problems and a lot of head scratching to do. So. <laughs> yep. And yeah, I totally agree. And Similar to that, I, I'm going to go kind of off, uh, you know, away from the order that we were um, going to go over the topics in because I think one kind of leads into the other. But I'm going to throw in one that wasn't on the list, and this is super simple. Um, have a flashlight available. What? Why? Why do you need a flashlight? Um, okay, <laughs> hear me out on this because this just reminded me talking about mem test. I've I've had people bring me computers before, and this happened like two or three times because it takes me that long to learn a lesson. Apparently, um, where I couldn't get the operating system to install at all, and um, I could have ran memtest, but in this situation, after a few hours of cursing and fighting with it, I just opened the chassis, get a flashlight, shine on the capacitors, and notice that they're leaking. Yeah. Oh, there's the problem. That's why I can't. And, you know, you don't really think of that because it's not very common. I think I've seen it maybe five times in my entire career, so it's not, like, super common. But when you're buying a server from somebody, like, secondhand, absolutely look at the capacitors before you take it home. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble because if you didn't know to look for that, you might be you know, troubleshooting that server for hours trying to figure out why it won't work. Just to find out um, physical layer, there's some leaky or bulging capacitors, there's your problem. So um, that's another thing. And the other thing I'll, I'll throw in there too, because I'm about to talk about buying uh, workstations or laptops or whatever. Um, because we need a good workstation or laptop to modify our home lab, right? We want a decent machine to do all that config and all that. Um, one of the things that I recommend people do, like if you're going at a going to a used computer store, let's say, and they have a desktop on display or a laptop, and you're thinking about buying it, it's a good price, and it's a solid machine. Um, usually it's going to run Windows. 
at first, go to the event viewer and filter for system errors or critical errors and look at that before you buy it. I don't care if it's like a server, if they have a, if they have a monitor plugged into a server, I don't know if they will, um, or desktops, laptops, especially, look at the event viewer. Because if you have like a failing hard drive, it's just going to flood the Windows event log with errors and other things are going to flood the Windows event log with errors. And you'll know right then and there that, okay, there's something going on with this machine. So I really shouldn't take this one home. And it's so easy to do once you learn how to do it, to go into the event viewer. And that's not going to be like, um, a foolproof test. This is definitely a great machine because there's no errors. There's there's going to be errors because Windows always has errors. So don't be alarmed if there's a few, but you'll know the critical ones when you see them. And that'll just give you an idea of what not to buy, um, which is kind of like one of my tricks that I, I go, um, go through. But um, getting into buying laptops and desktops, um, my tip is to consider used more often than most do. Like I love System76, I love Tuxedo computers and Lenovo and all those, they're great. Buying a new computer is awesome. If you have the money, I mean, what's what's better than that? I have a brand new rig, that's just so cool. But in reality, we can't afford a you know machine that's over a grand you know often. So sometimes you only have two or $300 extra. So what do you do? So that's why I wanted to bring this up because um, business class laptops and desktops are absolutely the way to go. I personally, I know this is an extreme opinion. I hate consumer level laptops because yeah, you I can go to Walmart. Yeah. You can go to Walmart or Meyer or whatever your local store is. You could get a brand new computer, not even a Chromebook, an actual PC laptop for two or $300. You absolutely can. And it's going to be fast. It's going to be efficient because hardware is cheaper. Now it, you're going to think, man, this is a great machine. Um, but I've repaired these things and I've literally told people like if they crack their screen because I'd replace it, I need you to buy a bezel too because I know how this is going to go. It's all going to crack. It's all going <laughs> to fall apart the minute I take it apart because the chassis is just bogus. Um, there's a reason why it's two or three hundred dollars. Trust me on this. But the two or three hundred dollars that you might have to buy a brand new machine you could use that same two or three hundred dollars to go on eBay and buy a um, business class laptop, for example, or a business class workstation. That's a few generations old, which is why it's two or three hundred dollars. It's not the newest one. However, I would argue that the build quality is going to be better than anything you'll buy new at that same price. Plus, um, you know, business class laptops just last forever and they're often really fast, like the processes are decent because processors are not changing, in my opinion, as often as they used to. So throw a solid state drive in an older, you know, two generation old computer, that thing will fly and you'll definitely have a better machine and absolutely research Linux compatibility first, if that's what you want to run. But I would highly recommend people go that direction instead of buying new if their budget is really low, um, because I think they'll get a better machine for their money. They last a lot longer. They have, um, I'm assuming everyone here is going to reload them right away. So the bloatware problem is less of an issue, but they generally ship with less bloatware on them with the business class ones. The other thing too, and I've done a video on this before, uh, if you dig around on my channel, I probably five or six years ago, I had a couple taken apart laptops and I was discussing that exact thing, the difference between the higher quality ones. And that hasn't changed in five or six years. You know, I haven't really readdressed that video but it also doesn't really need to be readdressed. If you look at the build quality on them, uh, it's substantially different. The uh, the kind of flimsy, floppy nature of these, uh, how thin can we get it and everything else is just not as good because they're trying to produce it for the consumers in the mass market. So they cut every corner possible to make them you know, not as high quality. You take something like one of the Lenovo ThinkPad series, which yep. I've been a fan of for a while. They're just a pretty solid build and a pretty solid feel. But if you can go new, don't get me wrong, especially if you're going, I want an absolute Linux compatible one. Look at something like the um, System76. Now, and I have not got my hands on one. I have not ordered one because I just don't have a need for a new laptop. But I definitely, I know there's been real, a lot of positive feedback from several friends I've had and uh, other YouTube reviewers on the framework laptops. Uh, I think that's a great idea. I like where they're going with it. I don't personally have any review experience with it, but my overall feeling from the people who have reviewed it, that they're being honest and it's a pretty quality product. So I would say, yes, a lot of, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, if you are looking at some of the alternatives, but we know it's a home lab show. That's why we mentioned the budget conscious stuff first. Right. Not, right. Exactly. Not everyone's got the budget just to run out on buying stuff or, um, 
you know, get stuff sent to them because they do reviews sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just the best uh, job perk ever. But what we understand it's not a perk that very many people have. We're the few, yeah. right? Um, we're the one percent, I guess. Yeah. Um, but specifically, I would say look for Dell Latitude or the Lenovo T series yep. ThinkPads, um, because just because it's Lenovo doesn't mean they're all good because their consumer level machines are every bit as bad, in my opinion, as right. anyone else's. Like they're Dell's business or class Lenovo's yep. or business class Dell's, yep. not the stuff that Dell sells at the retail stores as often. So, <laughs> yep, T <laughs> series. Although I think the model naming changed in uh, Lenovo's ThinkPad series now. I can't remember what it is now, um, but or did it? Because I'm not. I think it is it still the T series because that's what I've always known it as. And then there's the latitudes have pretty much been latitudes forever. Um, yeah. those are some to look at. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. What's on the next? So system rescue CD is really quick. Cause I'm, it's just a quick mention system rescue CD, download it, uh, put it on your flash drive, have it ready. You, you can use it for, uh, cloning hard drives like clonezilla, for example, it, it actually supports that, but there's other things it could do too. It has a graphical user interface. You can um, use it for file recovery or things of that nature. So just throwing a quick mention out there, if you've ever used one of those, um, what I call a multi-rescue tool CD or whatever it is, they have all these, you know, everything but the kitchen sink in there. There's there's several of these out there. I like System Rescue CD. It's it's uh, treated me very well. So I think it's just one of those things to have available if uh, you need to recover files or do some hardware testing, clone a hard drive. Um, another quick mention, and I'm going to, uh, make this very quick. Cause we had, I think we had an episode about this, about Clonezilla. Yes. Um, now if you've seen that episode, you, you know, that it's, um, you know, going to help you clone a hard drive, but what you might not know is that if you have a failed hard drive, or I should say a failing hard drive, this doesn't always work, but if you really want to get that machine going again, you could try, keyword <laughs> try, to take an image of it with Clonezilla, but activate the advanced options and tell it to continue if it reaches a bad sector, um, which means it'll still take an image of the hard drive, but it won't be the best image because there's going to be you know a couple of errors, unfortunately. This is for people that are really desperate. Obviously, reloading is better. Mm -hmm. If you have it scripted or automated, do that instead. But if you, you know, just couldn't get to backing it up or automating anything and you put like weeks of work into this thing and you really don't want to lose it. Um, you could just clone the hard drive, activate that option to continue when it recover encounters bad sectors and then restore that image onto a good hard drive. It might work because I have seen this happen several times where people were thinking, oh man, it's the end. I've lost everything. Like I can't get this thing to boot. And then I do that. And then um, you'll still probably need to do like a, um, a file system check no matter what, because there's errors. But after you do that, it might fix it. But it's just something to try, something to keep in mind. Um, if nothing else, it might let you pull files off the um, hard drive too. So I just wanted to throw a mention out there for that. Yep. Um, what's the next one on here? Crowd second fail to ban. Yep. Yep. Um, we list those together because they're very similar. In fact, uh, fail to ban inspired crowd sec. And the way they handle this is kind of similar because what they what they aim to do is offer a layer of protection. I don't want to say it's going to protect your server, but it's going to, you know, obviously increase your security. Uh, nothing's 100 percent. But if configured properly, fail to ban, for example, will look for certain things in the log. For example, it could be watching the SSH log and then seeing that there's someone just trying and trying and trying to get into your server. It can block them by adding a firewall rule. You set it for how many attempts you're willing to let it have, because I don't know, maybe you mess up the password four or five times because you're like me and you're a klutz, but you never mess it up seven times. So if someone is just, you know, set it to seven. If it goes beyond seven, um, it, it can basically create a firewall rule to block them. You could put a whitelist to, you know, add your own IP in there so you don't block yourself ever. Um, and it, uh, it's not just SSH. You could configure it for Apache, Nginx. There's just a huge list of different things. And you could also create your own jail. That's what they're called, jails, for something else. Just tell it what to look for in the log file that constitutes a concern to you. And if it sees it, it can go ahead and block it. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Um, CrowdSec is basically very similar to uh, fail to ban. 
I don't know if you could do custom, I think you could do custom uh, jails, so to speak. They're not quite called jails on the CrowdSec side. But CrowdSec also creates firewall rules when it sees some activity that it is not appropriate, like a brute force attempt or some other kind of security thing that it notices, it'll block the IP. But another thing that it can do is it downloads a block list from you know, CrowdSec, which is you know, paying attention to this and seeing these attacks happen. So if one IP is getting attacked by another, then it knows, well, that IP is doing some some shady stuff. So we need to keep an eye on that. And it could let all the other clients know that IP is bad. So that way it helps increase security by leveraging the crowd or, you know, their users and helps enhance it that way. That's the trade-off though, because if you use CrowdSec, it's going to send activity it sees, you know, negative activity like intrusion attempts up to the mothership. So that way it could let all the other ones know. So you have to be okay with that. I don't see why you wouldn't be. It's just trying to grab IPs, but um, that's a trade-off. And I do believe if you, you know, don't like that, you could pay for it. Um, it's free otherwise. You could install it on 10,000 machines and it's fine for free. But if you want to opt out of, out of that, um, you know, information sharing, then that's, I, I believe, when there's a cost associated with it. Yeah. But it's so easy to install. Fail to ban, I would say, is a bit harder, but it's not hard. It's just CrowdSec is more of a turnkey. It's not completely turnkey, but it's closer to that. Fail to ban... If I remember correctly, bans or excuse me, it watches SSH by default, but it won't watch anything else unless you go in and enable the other different things that it has in the config file that you want it to watch for. I just think it's a really good to at least use fail to ban. Consider using CrowdSec if you want to um, have a you know global knowledge uh, power at your disposal there for that. But um, one or the other is fine. You should definitely want run, run, excuse me run one or the other, especially on machines that are uh, forward facing to the internet. Yeah, and the thing I like about CrowdSec, and fail to ban is great for the individual. And I see actually someone threw in a comment, and you can get tricky with it, taking the ban list that fail to ban creates. And let's say you're running a cluster of servers, create a list and automatically do it. But now you're getting into building a lot of engineering when the reality is you are not the only one with something open on the internet. That's just right. going to be the way the internet works. So the concept of CrowdSec, I really like how they're doing it because this really opens up an opportunity. And there are places like graynoise.io where you can get IP lists from. And there's a lot of threat intelligence data out there. There's, um, Alien Data has a free app feed uh, where you can go through and look for bad reputation IPs. This is kind of a cat and mouse game, but CrowdSec really takes it to the next level of not only building the lists in real time, time, having you help to contribute to those building of the list, then combine that with, you know, you can end up with these IPs blocks. So it doesn't even fill up your logs with noise. So if it, right away in Log4j was an easy example of this, they were sorting out uh, and gray noise was listing them. And so were other places like these are the known threat actors attacking these type of devices that are, you know, maybe unpatched and already having that list I in CrowdSec protects you in case you didn't patch. Um, but I know all of us and everyone listening to this already patches their systems right away as soon as something comes up. But on that mm -hmm. off chance that you know a person and they're not yeah. doing it. Yeah, um, asking for a friend. <laughs> asking for a friend here. Uh, it's nice to have an automated system that can roll out those block lists and it can buy you a little bit of time. It's not a replacement yep. for security at all, but everything, especially when there's a zero day out there, someone gets hit. That's how we learn about zero days. That's how we learn about these active attacks. Sometimes it's only through the attack that we learn what was broken. And this is an example that happened in some of the WordPress sites. If in CrowdSec does integrate right into uh, WordPress and the web applications. This is really cool because as soon as someone started uh, dropping all these attacks on these WordPress sites, right away, they're like, whoa. And it's not like there's a thousand IPs even doing the attack. It's like, here's a couple IPs that were initiating these attacks and exploiting this. Once that gets into a block list at CrowdSec, cool. Um, and then the people that wrote the different plugins for WordPress that were at fault, well, now we got to get those updated and we've now bought a little bit of time because we didn't even know about the problem. So it's another layer on your security. I think I, I really like what they're doing with it. And me and Jay talked about maybe we'll have yeah. them on to dive a little bit more in depth on their whole platform, how their business model works, because it's it's really a cool open source intelligence tool. I'm, I just really like what they're where they've uh, gone with it. And uh, it's something I'm diving into more. And Jay's got a video on it. I plan to dive in a little bit yeah. more. I've set up some demo servers I've been poking at with it. So, and I'm hoping they work on a, uh, they have a PF sense integration. 
but I think it's pretty manual right now. I'm hoping at some point they'll get a more in-depth PFSense integration too, because I think it'd be an awesome uh, addition to PFSense because, you know, it sits at the perimeter of your network. It can listen to the noise. It can report yeah. back and then automatically add block lists. So I think it's, it's going to be something that I think we're going to see a whole lot more of in the future. Field demand is a cool independent tool, but I, I like the full extensibility because it's putting security as a community effort just makes a lot of sense to me that, that mm -hmm. I, they hit the right nail on the head with it. Um, and their background is also in managing uh, hosting servers at scale. The, the developers had a hosting company. That's where they came up with the idea for all this. And then their idea was, well, why not do it for everyone, not just us? And that's where they've been really uh, pushing and expanding on it. So I'm excited. I want to, I want to talk to them about that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Maybe that'll be something we can set up. Yep. Uh, someone mentioned earlier, I just want to uh, give a shout out to Ventoy. Uh, it is a way to set up the multiple boot uh, USBs. Uh, it, I've never used it, but my staff has. It's a way to take some of those things like System Rescue CD, Memtest 86, and combine a few different ISOs, I believe, into one. I believe that's the right tool name. I've seen someone mention it in there. So, Yeah, something like a Ventool, Ventoy, something like that. Yeah, it's it's a great one. I, I haven't used it myself, but I've, I've heard a lot of people talking about it. I've read about it. I've seen um, you know, or I've read how to documents about it. Um, I probably should be using it because I have like 50 USB keys in a little bucket that I kind of sort through every time I'm looking for something. It'd probably yeah. um, make that a lot better for me. Maybe I should give that a shot. Yep. All right. Now, re related directly to the uh, tools that was offered by CrowdSec and Fail to Ban. Um, or you can even kind of throw in PF blocker. Those are all tools that identify things and then have block lists. Different, but can completely coexist at the same time is Sericata and Snort. Those are traffic analysis tools. And the rule sets based that they use are looking for specific sequence of events or attacks that can come through. Now, the efficacy of these products can be hampered by encryption. So it kind of depends on whether or not they have the ability to see into the traffic that's passing through them. Typically, you're going to run Sericot or Snort on an edge device, and it is built into PFSense. And one of the things I like about the way PFSense does it, they call it Sericata, they call it Snort, they don't call it just IDS. A lot of other companies are using Sericata in the back end. They just call it intrusion detection system or intrusion prevention system, you know, that's, but they don't tell you what it is and what the rules are around it. So it's kind of interesting um, that I, that PF sense is kind of a, you know, not the only one, but one of the companies that really exposes you to it and gives you everything to tune with it. Now, what these actually do is they're, they're looking for things like they can even look at the way DNS queries go out and you can say, you know, Hey, here's a rule set. If these DNS queries go out or they look like something bad or looks like it's resolving something, go ahead and have a block. Uh, I managed to block myself the other day on accident. I was actually thought my VPN went down from my home to my office. And it turned out Sarakata see me doing something with SSH and I wasn't thinking about it, but Sarakata goes, that's not the way that should have been done because I was hammering something on SSH as a test. And then it blocked me. <laughs> and then once you get on a blacklist, I couldn't even log back into my own firewall because I was banned. <laughs> so wow, yeah, and, um, <laughs> and it happens to all of us at some point. Sometimes, yeah, at some time you're like, oh, that's right, I shouldn't have done that. But right. nonetheless, I was doing some testing, and those are really good tools to use, though. And there's a cat and mouse game, though. Those rule sets that are being constantly updated, so it's another layer of security. So that's why I refer each one of these. They're not an end-all solution. They do coexist, and they're best, actually, to coexist with our solutions. Now, do you need Sericata and Snort um, on your home user system if you have no ports open? I would put it only in detection mode, so you can just kind of see things that might be interesting to you. Uh, they do take, and I have a video about tuning the rules, and it is a constant effort so sometimes there's a new rule that comes up that uh, it misidentifies something or the the rule identifies a specific attack pattern but also by the way this other tool looks like that attack pattern i think in the early days sync thing mm -hmm. the transport layer sync thing triggered something um unrelated altogether so it, at first you're like wait why is this thing attacking oh looks like sync thing triggers this uh this is where you get the false positives and because it's a pattern-based system and sometimes it's looking at traffic that it may not have full insight into it can be really difficult to absolutely right. nail down uh, that so you, it, it, it's not a it's not a hands-off type of thing and a lot of times when you see it in uh like the unified dream machine has sericata running under the hood um they don't give you as many 
tuning options for it and you're kind of just relying upstream on whatever the vendor pushes out for the tuning rules they get they give you such like a, a good better best or something i think they have a really generic way you turn mm -hmm. up how how secure do you want it and you crank it up to best next you know everything starts breaking and then you slide it down a little bit uh I don't know how much more tuning options they've added in, in Unified Dream Machine, but when you do something in uh, PF Sense, it's absolutely showing you the raw data so you can get a better understanding of what rules flagged and what rules you want to tune and maybe why you're tuning it, which usually, hey, highlight uh, the um, phrase that it found in error, the rule said it found in error, what it told you it blocked, <laughs> copy paste into your favorite search engine and uh, you'll probably find a result in a discussion forum about the rule, why it exists and what, what it may be a false positive of. So it actually helps you a lot with the research of why something's not working. And yes, even people who work in high levels at uh, security and SIM places, that's actually what they do. They, they'll sit there and look at a rule that's weird to them. They're like, I don't know this one, even with all my experience. And yes, they use Google search. That's for any of you that's thinking about getting into the enterprise market. Um, People are still on Stack Exchange, right to the enterprise market. Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, let them they they really are. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised that the highest security level just doesn't disable every network interface and every device. Well, that makes the most sense, right? Just break them all. Break them just, all. Just, just, you, just, just disable secure. everything you LAN it. related. Just, just kill the entire TCP/IP stack 100%. Just to annihilate the whole thing, and then, uh, yeah, you'll be way more secure at that point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Probably useless, but secure nonetheless. All right, we got. Git for security? Yeah, this is a fun trick, but there's going to have to be some asterisks here because I don't want to oversell this as like a really good idea in every use case, but it does help sometimes if your um, server gets, you know, owned, but it's not owned by something like, you know, full system level. Uh, for example, let's say you have a website and you have um, some HTML files that you're serving, just something simple. And someone just, you know, gets in there and they just corrupt the files. They they put the uh, base64 code encoding in there and your PHP files. And next thing you know, there's a crypto miner. Um, if you have, if you make your HTML directory a Git repository, and I'm not telling you to upload that to GitHub, because you can have a local Git repository that doesn't go anywhere. There's no Git server. You could just have a right. local Git repository that doesn't even leave that particular server anywhere. And you can get the website or whatever, the web app working the way you want it, and then just um, commit right then and there. And if there, you know, someone does break in and they, they do some bad things there, you could just do like a Git status. You see all the files that they've modified and then you could do Git checkout on everything and it's like they never did anything. Um, now, the asterisk is that um, obviously that's not always going to work because what I do is I make the Git repository owned by root. So you can't commit unless you're root. So even if someone breaks in as the web server user, they can't get into the Git directory and, and muck that up unless there's a privilege escalation trick that they use to get up to root or there's vulnerability chaining. Yes, they absolutely can corrupt the Git database. So I don't want this to seem like a end-all be-all security trick. But if it's a lower tier intrusion that does not you know, go beyond that, um, it can help. It, and it's so easy to do because it's a local Git repository. Just do git init inside the directory and then git commit everything there and then from that point on you at least have that starting point um it doesn't take the place of backups doesn't take the place of automation this is just a i only have five minutes to fix this problem and i got to get to work kind of thing right um i don't want to oversell it but i i have seen this happen where someone just does get checkout and everything and then um it just makes everything like nothing ever happened um as long as they didn't get outside that directory and infects the rest of the system somehow then that might actually help you out yeah, and I want to make sure there's that clarification because there gets to be gets to be a lot of confusion in this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, GitHub is a service which is currently owned by Microsoft, um, and Git is a tool. And it, 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 a lot of people think of Git and GitHub as one and the same, but they're they're just an opportunistic company that said, "Hey, we can throw a hub at the end of this. We have this domain, and we're going to offer it as a Git 
repository hosting. Now, it's probably good that a lot of people use it. It's been a really popular place even since Microsoft purchased it for hosting a lot of open source projects um, and allows you to easily get clone, throw the name in there um, and pull down information on there. But they are separate things. I just want to make sure that's always um, very yeah. clear. There's because you can also because you, you're you using uh, GitLab, is it, Jay? Yep, GitLab. Yeah. They're, a com they're an absolute competitor that also uses Git of GitHub. Um, you know, I use GitHub. Jay uses GitLab. I was going to switch because we were all going to protest. Um, and well, everyone said they were going to protest. Jay actually protested. Because I think yeah, you I moved from GitHub over to GitLab, right? Yeah, but I ended up opening up GitHub for, um, you know, the YouTube channel. It's not where I keep, like, my configs for the business. But... GitHub is now where I want things to be like internet facing. If I go over something in a video, Git, GitHub is a good thing to learn. So I put some of my stuff out there so people can fork it or maybe put in a pull request or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I did switch to GitLab for all of my production stuff on my end. And I like it. It's really cool. Um, if I take Microsoft out of the equation, I like GitHub and GitLab both. I also like Git T, which is something that I want to cover soon. Um, I don't have a video about it right now, but that's a roll your own Git server that you could use instead of either GitLab or GitHub and just have your own. You could put it on Linode instance, for example, run Git T over there and you have your own Git server that's um, your own in your, your, your control. So there's definitely options. You can get the code out there if you want to. But the, I think one of the beauties of having Git as a local tool that's not connected to a service is you could have local repositories for version control, even if you have like, I don't know, another family member that's also into IT and stuff, and they're also learning with you, and then something breaks, you can just do a git diff. What did you do? Uh, yeah, you modified this file. Why did you do that? <laughs> right. You know, you have some you have some traceability there, and especially if you work in an you know IT department, you can even have like people committing changes there. It it just it's just becomes a really awesome way to modify or excuse me to maintain server configs. Um, and in this case, you probably shouldn't upload that to any of those Git services. Just keep it local. This isn't like your um, pet Python project, right? This is your app. You want to keep that local, but it could give you some additional options that may help as, as long as that intrusion wasn't like a higher level that broke out of the jail, so to speak, and infected your entire system. Absolutely. Jay, you have a weird one on the list. Yes, I do, don't I? You, you're probably surprised to see that one, weren't you? I was surprised to see this next one. Um, and I think you're talking about ripping CDs, right? I am. <laughs> yes, um, because, you know, I was thinking about, I'm not going to get into the drama and the politics about Spotify and streaming services and all that, but there's one universal criticism that I have, which is these services, these cloud music services are good because, you know, I, could, I don't have to um, have like a, Two, two terabyte hard drive with me everywhere I go. I could just stream as needed. But the problem is when they, you know, what happens when your favorite artist loses a license or they can't negotiate a license or something like that? Um, for the longest time, Tool wasn't even on Spotify. And that really made me mad because <laughs> I want to listen to Tool. So what do I do? Um, and I, I feel like with um, Google Music going away, uh, it's now YouTube Music. You used to be able to buy MP3s and things. And I used to have this Python script I would use to actually purge the hidden comment that Google put in MP3 files that would have traceability. I just purged that and I had my own, you know, I own this content. I can, uh, I know the music industry would disagree with me when I say, say I own it, but I do feel like I bought it. I own it. It's mine. I'm going to listen to this until the end of time, but now that's gone. So what do we do? So I, I do kind of feel like ripping CDs is an important thing because you could set up like Plexamp or um, one of the other hosted music players or Volumio, for example, on a Raspberry Pi and create a jukebox. And because I know this isn't initially like a home lab topic, but it becomes a home lab topic because it's not much different than running a Plex server and watching the Avengers, right? Um, sometimes you don't want to watch a movie. You just want to jam out to some Metallica or something. And it's, a good, it's good to have something to do that with. And when it comes to ripping CDs, um, what would you use nowadays? Because most people don't rip CDs anymore. And for all I know, CDs can go away altogether. But there's something about having a physical copy of something that if I, you know, foobar the MP3s or whatever, I'd actually rip an AUG format personally, but um, I can recreate that content infinitely. And it doesn't depend on a record company's negotiations to whether I can do that. 
And the tool that I'm going to recommend, because I'm, I'm sure this is not something that people are thinking about right now, but I'm just putting the idea back in everyone's head about ripping CDs is called Asunder. A-S-U-N-D-E-R has been my tool of choice for so many years, I can't even remember now. So I've been using that to rip CDs and have that digital copy. And then I put it into Volumio. Um, I also have Plex pointed to my music share as well. So I can use Plex amp when I'm on the go to listen to my music collection. I think I have over like 150 artists in my collection right now and probably over 10,000 songs. So it's um, definitely a lot to keep track of, but it's really awesome to have that control. And until they discontinue audio CDs altogether, which let's be honest, you know, they will. Um, we have this ability now to just um, go to a flea market and buy a stack of CDs for a dollar and throw it in our music collection. Yeah. And I, there is such an interesting concept and, you know, having some younger kids, they don't, they, some think about it a little bit, but it's not as uh, prevalent to them that we used to own all of our media. It, it wasn't the inconvenience right. of CDs. I mean, granted, yeah, there's an inconvenience of swapping out audio disc or anything like that. And CDs, obviously, I've never been the biggest fan because they have a delicate nature of them. And I remember forever ago, you know, mm -hmm. you scratch one, you're like, ah, oh, I lost the music. I could buy another one of those. And uh, there was places I used to, you know, especially go to places to buy all the used audio. But right now, so many people in the controversies around media rights when you subscribe to some service and that service can't negotiate with the artist you like, but they were able to before. This is a really interesting thing that is bringing back the rights talk. And I, I'm really happy about that because I don't like the concept like that. I pay an artist on a subscription. No, no, no. I pay. That's not that's a concept. A lot of people seem to be confused by. No, the artist gets paid and has the ability to sell their same work when it comes to music in a digital form multiple times. That's a really cool thing. Now, the artist has an opportunity to make a lot of money um, by having a popular song and each one of us pay for the right to use that song. I don't think that's an unreasonable request, but as right. I can play that at my leisure because I paid for it whenever I decide I want to play that. And I think this um, it's a lot. It's really annoying when you think about it, because I wanted to watch something um, that I knew used to be on Netflix and now it's not. And I'm like, oh, man, I wanted to, you know, watch it again or share it with someone. And they're like, no, you can't. I'm like, wow, I can't even have friends over to rewatch this movie we wanted to talk about um, from mm -hmm. a number of years ago. But it used to be and they a licensing deal moved it to another platform. And um, yeah, I, I, I bothers me that we're getting away from it. I think hopefully uh, some of these big controversies that come up bring people back to it because you pay right. for the media and I don't mind. Uh, it obviously it's different when you're paying for it as a service. I, when I pay for one of those music services, um, I don't get the rights. I get temporary rights as a service is the way I would describe that via streaming. But I, I'm fine to go back to the days of purchasing them. I don't mind and I do this already. And unfortunately, and I've been, I get lazy and out of convenience, I'll buy something through like the Google store and buy a movie so I can watch it whenever I want. But there's still a concern that if something were to change with that movie I bought, some licensing deal, if I bought it through Google or any service changes, could I lose access to it? That bothers right. And, and even worse, I mean, they could have an alternate version where um, Han Solo didn't shoot first and then you wouldn't have any control because it changed on you, right? Exactly. <laughs> I need to know. Yeah, I need the version where Han Solo shot first, not the other one that other people have out there. I mean, this could get bootlegged and changed and, you know. Right. <laughs> but I think it's such a huge conversation that um, may not really be the best fit for this, but I podcast completely, but it kind of is. Um where we really need to have a conversation about rights in digital media because it seems to me that people are, in general, no, I'm not judging anyone in particular here, but in general, the, the public is okay with losing things. And, you know, it'd be one thing where I have a music CD and I accidentally step on it. Okay, that's my fault, right? I, I shouldn't have done that. I broke it. I'll go replace it. But if that CD that's on my desk was just, just disappeared because a record company didn't think I needed it anymore. What? I paid for that. Are you going to give me a refund? Um, so if I went to a music service, and I'll use this one example. It's the first time I've ever noticed this. Uh, Walmart, this is so long ago, used to actually sell MP3s a long time ago. Um, so long ago, in fact, I bet most people don't even remember that. And I bought maybe one or two albums from them. I don't even know why. And I got an email 
uh, sometime after saying, yeah, we're discontinuing that service. So download your stuff while you still have a chance. Well, at least they allowed you to download it again. But still, it's like if you have your um, right to access media in someone else's data center, they will shut that down. Nintendo is a good um, example of this. You buy games on the Wii. Guess what? You're if that Wii breaks, you're done. All your investment is completely gone. They are not going to keep that data for you to re-download because they don't feel like they need to. And people should be fighting this because if you're going to gain control and, and hold the keys to my content, then you need to keep it available to me or give me my money back. But that's unfortunately not how it works, at least with CDs and um, you know ripping DVDs and Blu-rays and things like that. You have a physical copy that if you did accidentally delete them, you could, or your hard drive died, you could actually recreate the media infinitely, you have control. And I think that's something that I, I feel like a lot of people should really consider again in 2022, that yeah, it's nice to have everything in these um, media company servers available to us until it's not available anymore. That's not really fun. Yeah, and I think it probably goes to even when you do the downloaded games on the Switch and things like that, um, you're talking oh, yeah. about, yeah, the, the same concept where you don't actually own the game anymore. And if you it's not like the, because Jay has a lot of the physical cartridges from the old school games right. and things like that. And uh, yeah, that it's you, you own it. You can play, you can play the uh, final fantasy two anytime you want. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, but the thing is, it's, it's like, I, I hope I'm wrong, but someday, you know, like the Nintendo switch is great. Guess what? At some, at some point, Nintendo switch mm -hmm. is going to be considered retro. It's going to be several Nintendo systems beyond that. And you won't be able to download download those games. If that SD card fails that you downloaded those games to, worse, the system failed because it's locked to the system, you will not be able to play those games again. You cannot get those games back on the system again because they are some kind of uh, serialization to the system that you're playing it on, uh, which is fine. Now you call customer service, my Switch broke, I need a new one, or I bought a new one, I need to transfer everything. They'll absolutely help you out with that. And I've had them do that for me. But what happens when uh, the Switch isn't really a thing that's being sold anymore? Guess what? They don't care. Um, there goes your investment. So um, I think that's. I think there needs to be like a, like a bill of rights, so to speak, for you know if you're going to sell me digital content, then these are the expectations that you need to make it available to me if I need it again in the future, or you know I think that's the least we could ask. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll take a. The, I think that's where we'll stop at the list we have. We have actually a few more and we'll save them mm -hmm. for the next show. Um, yep. And I'll throw out a couple um, answers in here because I've seen people asking about this and this is great directly related to the media topic. And it's always a point of confusion. Someone says, you know, hey, Tom, how do you talk? To, how's your phone talk to you? And I use MB. I, use, I was using Plex. I moved over to MB. Um, mm -hmm. I like the interface on MB a little better and MB just worked better for movies. I don't know why I was having weird stuttering issues. Uh, and stopping issues with Plex. It just would stop sending data. I don't know why. I loaded MB. It works on the same server. No problem. It's not a it's not a resource issue because neither one's using up that many resources on that system. But I did a video, and me and Jay talked about this with VLANs. The phone is an IoT device, and so mm -hmm. is the Chromecast, by which it will broadcast to. I have the MB player loaded on my phone. I have MB on the IoT network with my phone on the IoT network with my Chromecast on the IoT network. Those are all on the same network so they can easily talk to each other because the number of forum posts I have of, oh, I'm trying to get these things to bridge across multiple networks and keep the security is a headache and it doesn't always work well. Mm -hmm. The portion where how do you get data over to MB or Plex is the question someone asked. And it's real easy. The NAS has multiple legs on it, so to speak. We have a network interface that has a Windows share, an SMB share, if you will, CIFS. And the Samba share is on the secure network. I drop the data over to the Samba share. The Samba share is not available because it doesn't need to be on the IoT network because you're not sharing these over Samba. You're sharing them through the program MB. So MB is attached to the IoT network, but the back end of where the data is stored within MB, which is on my NAS, is attached via a Samba share that's accessible on a secure network. It's as simple as that. There's not, it, it's a nice secure way to do it, and it makes your life a lot easier. Uh, 
because you're not trying to figure out how to get all the devices to talk there. And it makes MB stream perfectly fine there. I can use the app on my phone. The apps all look for local discovery on the same subnet. So as long as you're all in the same subnet, they all play happy together. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of clever hacks and we'll, we'll definitely get to them. I'm sure another dev random episode will have like uh, quality of life tips for how to get your data to one place to the other, sync this to that, or whatever clever combination. I think that's kind of the most fun thing about Home Lab is like we have all these different things. How can we combine them to have the most badass configuration we could possibly get um, in combination of uh, services? So, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that makes sense. And the last question I'll mention, because it's just a really quick one, uh, and it, it rolls back to the very first thing we talked about, our sponsor, Linode. Someone says, hey, how can I look at my network externally? I mean, you can use things like Steve Gibson's Shields Up and look for open ports. Yep. But if you wanted to dive into doing it yourself, you can go ahead and sign up with Linode, get an account going, and use a tool like Nmap on a Linode instance to scan backwards towards your IP address, because it's your IP address assigned to you from your ISP, because someone asked, well, how do I know if I have any ports open and things like that yeah run a full port scan with nmap externally is a way you could kind of test for your security internally yeah. testing for your security is a little different um if you want to test application security kali linux is pretty much the go-to for having right. a complete set of tools on there runner-up's going to be parrot linux as well um that's for internal testing i mean you could run that in a cloud instance as well but it's a little bit harder uh to pull it back and you may as well if you're testing something locally a local application you may as well run it local for uh, speed and things like that but just you know spin up a linode instance to do an end map back to you easy way to tell if your ports are open so yeah the way i see it um there's a lot of people running end map against your ip why not join them <laughs> why not join them <laughs> why not do it yourself i mean everyone else is doing that right um you might as well see what they're saying yeah Absolutely. So thank you very much for everyone who joined us uh, today. This was definitely a fun episode and yeah. we should listen. Nmap is one of the tools in there because it's definitely, you know, what ports are open on this server? What can I see from this? Did, did my mm -hmm. firewall rules actually work? Um, Nmap, there's a mm -hmm. easy way to do the testing in it. So even built into PFSense, you can actually test from PFSense and look at different sections of your network with it. So yeah. You can do OS fingerprinting too. If you don't know what the heck is this device that's connected to my DCP server, yeah. uh, you can try to do an OS fingerprint. Oh, that's a that's a game system. That's that's what that is. Or yep. you know, hopefully you know what it is after you run it. Yeah. And you can go, I mean, uh, boy, there's a lot of, you know, I haven't messed with it as much, but there's a lot of Nmap scripting out there uh, that allows for some testing. It's not as, it's not a full vulnerability scanner, but it will go a little further than parts open. There's different Nmap scripts that can be added to it for some further insight. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we, and it's another tool that I don't know if there's enough to talk about it for a full episode, um, but definitely a great tool overall to have in your toolkit. That's right. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, send us over some more feedback. We always look forward to that. We love doing the Q&A episodes, and uh, right now, everything's on schedule for next week. We only had one yep. skip, so uh, convergence of happenings sometimes happens with life. Good news is yep. both me and Jay had something on the same thing that caused it, so uh, we both had our day off at the same one. <laughs> yeah, some Dev Random caused us to take a week off, and now we're doing an episode called Dev Random. Yep, exactly. <laughs> It's a full circle here. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.